we will start to, to move on. Um, as you know, many know Ken Martin, and if you don't know him, you, you will know him by tonight, uh, who has been uh, a real face and face of APS for, for many years. Uh, he's going to be talking about the development of a thematic exhibit, sharing the good and the bad from his own um, and blood donations. And, um, you know, I think exhibiting is really one of the pillars of the, you know, buyers, sellers, collectors, uh, dealers, but uh, but exhibiting the research that goes with it. But Ken is the director of expertising at the American Philatelic Society in Belfont in PA. He's been a stamp collector since friends brought stamp to school during the fifth grade. He joined the APS in 1980 and became an APS volunteer in 1982. In 1985 and 86, he served as the president of the Junior Philatelists of America. He's been involved with every U.S. <laughs> international show since Ameripex in 1986. He began as a full-time APS employee <laughs> in 1995. He first exhibited in 1995. He became a nationally accredited philatelic judge in 2002, and he served as a philatelic judge for nearly uh, 100 events. I think uh, Lancopex has been one of them too. Uh, he's a blood donor himself, having given whole blood and plates it over 500 times. He served yeah. as board chair for the Red Cross Mid Central PA chapter of the Red Cross Greater Allegheny. <laughs> If we could uh, go on uh, mute. Um, he served as board chair for the Red Cross Mid-Central PA chapter and the Red Cross Greater Alliance Blood Region. He currently serves on the board for his Rotary District and for Foxdale Village Retirement Community and previously served 10 years on the Patton Township Planning Commission and six years on the board for the Happy Valley Administration Bureau. Ken has turned his three passions of lately, blood donation and service into his lifelong pursuits and a civic and his APS service and his exhibit on blood donations are just examples of this. I'm sure that those of you who have spent any time in APS will or read the uh, APA journal. I know Ken very well and I hope you're as excited as I am tonight uh, to welcome Ken if you'll join me in our welcome uh, tonight speaking at, at Lancaster at our stamp show. Question for you. Ken, do you want questions during or after or doesn't matter? I'm willing to do both. Okay, so we will do that. And we will all end mute. And uh, Ken, you're on. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to try to share a screen. Hopefully this uh, mm -hmm. works. You can see a screen, I hope. Yes, we're good. Okay, good. And it's great to see so many of you. I've known there's a number of people on here I've known more than 20 years. On a variety of capacities, um, I know there's uh, uh, presidents of affiliates or former presidents. There's exhibitors. There's a good. Uh, there's people who serve as estate advisors and have helped APS in many ways. So it's great to see many people, many familiar faces, and uh, some a few new faces as well. Um, th this is meant to be informal, um, and so if you want to interrupt with questions, that's fine. I'll be glad. So for an overview, I have 30 slides total. Um, hopefully it won't take more than about 30 minutes. We have plenty of time for questions. Um, I could speak for hours, but uh, in fact, I'm only showing a few pages. I think I have 13 to 15 pages from an exhibit. Some good ones, some bad ones I'll show as examples. And I'll talk a little bit about exhibiting in general. So this is sort of the, the overview. And I don't want to assume too much. Um, this is probably way too basic, but uh, uh, first thing I wanted to talk about is, you know, philatelic exhibits and thematic exhibits and differentiate an exhibit from a collection. An um, exhibit hopefully tells a story, um, like a book should have an introduction, a body and conclusion. Um, exhibits in the United States are normally shown in frames similar to normally what you see in the lower right is the more standard, what are known as Canadian frames, but were used at Washington 2006 and have been used at some other shows. You see in the front on the left-hand slide and the more traditional, well called the Jenkins frames that were originally designed for Ameripex 86 in the back on the bottom left. Um, most frames today that at least national level shows, and I'd say most local and regional shows are using are designed to handle 16, eight and a half by 11 pages in the United States. Although um, 
You can do one large 35 inch by 47 inch page if you want. And the frame is the 16, it's kind of hard to transport, but you can certainly do that. Uh, just a brief history of philatelic exhibiting. Um, stamp shows, the first ones that, I, that I'm aware of were in the 1870s. No, I wasn't there, but uh, uh, that's what I understand. Um, you can see first US stamp exhibition, Shirley Said, 1889. Um, but for a long time, exhibiting really was just people showing their collections. And in fact, the best awards basically went to the collections that were worth the most. It was really just uh, um, who could spend the most money. Um, and that's how the bin room idea came, comes, the, the, the name comes about. Some of you may have heard of the bin room. Traditionally, only a very small part of the exhibit was on display. Uh, might have actually just been in an album or something, not necessarily in a frame, but the majority of it was in a room where the judges looked at it, reviewed and made their decisions. So the, the general public couldn't see the majority of the exhibits. And that was pretty much the standard up until the 1960s. And so there've been lots of changes in exhibiting if you look at the last 50 years. Um, from the, the World Series competitions for national show grand award winners to compete against each other. That was Gordon Morrison, former assistant postmaster general's idea um, to committee on setting up standards to accredit judges, at least at the national or international level and national shows, a manual of judging. Uh, in the 1980s, single frame exhibits were introduced. Um, I mentioned 1986 was basically the, the, the major introduction of the type of frame that's used at most shows today. And generally an evolution accepting more and more different types of exhibits. Um, in the 60s or 70s, you would just expect to basically see stamps. Even postal history would rarely be shown. Um, thematics, first day covers, postcards, other things are are much newer and uh, all took time to be accepted, so to speak. Um, but and I've, I've sent a copy of this presentation as well to Paul, which he's welcome to, to share with any of you or if any of you want it, because I'm not gonna go through everything in detail because it would take way too long if I did on some of these pages. Um, just why exhibit? Um, I have list what? Eight, eight reasons possibly there. They're not necessarily all the reasons, but there's different reasons. It doesn't have to be to win high awards. It can be to educate viewers. It can be to share what you have. Um, I think one of the best reasons is actually it helps you acquire new materials. You let people see what you have. They may have material for you or may see material at, a, at another dealer has or whatever and point it out. So, um, it's a great way often of uh, bringing attention to what you're collecting and having other people um, help you find additional material. Um, what's required to be an exhibitor, just in general, obviously you need some materials, some knowledge, some time and some money. Um, money doesn't have to be huge amounts, depending what you want. Do you wanna get an a international Grand Prix award? Yes, you are gonna need a lot of money. Um, but it can range from local to national to international shows. And a very small percent of stamp collectors ever exhibit, probably. Um, and depending how you define exhibit, because some, some clubs may have closed line exhibits or very informal at their own meetings or whatever, but probably fewer than 5% of the APS members have ever competitively exhibited. Um, so it's a small number. Now, look a little bit more at thematic exhibits. I will say that there's advantages and disadvantages. First, I probably should point out thematic and topical, I'm not using identically. A topical exhibit would be an exhibit, if there's a topical exhibit related to blood donation, then every item on there should be directly show a blood donation, show blood, something like that. The thematic exhibit can, can delve into the history and more of the story. So people that are critical in the, in the um, understanding circulation of blood and understanding you know, how to do uh, antiseptic methods and, and so forth, 
uh, but people that are related to it or institutions, organizations like the Red Cross or whatever, those would all be included. So thematic is a, a broader approach. Um, but in my opinion, thematic exhibits are gonna have broader appeal. Hopefully they appeal not only to stamp collectors, but some of the people who are interested in the subject. Um, often, but not always, they may be less expensive um, in general because many themes, um, you're not gonna have older or the most expensive stamps. Now, if your theme is royalty, something related to royalty on stamps, it may cost you a fortune because obviously that's what was traditionally on the early stamps of almost every country. Um, and there's gonna be many, many very expensive ones and you wanna always show the best stamps available to, to show something. Um, I would argue thematic exhibits requires broader philatelic and subject knowledge than a traditional or probably even a postal history. You not only have to have the philatelic knowledge, but you have to have the subject knowledge on whether it be blood donation, whether it be cats, whatever your, your subject is. And for the philatelic knowledge, it needs to be broader too, because one of the things you're being judged upon is your philatelic knowledge by the, the um, breadth of different elements or different types of material. Um, so you can't just know one um, stamp all the way down to being able to plate it to specific positions. You need to know about different types of stamps, you know, V-mail, booklets, meters, any test stamps, all those types of things that you're expected to have in a thematic exhibit that many more traditional exhibits would not be expected. Um, I do think there's a little bit more variability in judging. That's uh, that could be considered an advantage or a disadvantage, but there's fewer thematic exhibits and the, there's not a lot of judges that specialize in them. Um, so you have, um, in some cases, their judges are less comfortable and they don't have as much experience judging thematic exhibits. So I think you're gonna see a little bit more variability. Probably not as much as like a postcard exhibit where it goes a step further in that you see even fewer of those and less experience and less confidence. So I think you'd even get more variability, but generally in, in areas or types of exhibits that are um, not shown as frequently, um, judges don't have as much experience with, you're gonna have a little bit more variability. Um, just some ideas for putting together a thematic exhibit, select the subject. Hopefully you have a reason for showing it what you want the, why should the viewer care about the subject? A um, little bit easier, I think, for a thematic exhibit than others, but you always need to define a logical and defendable scope. Um, it's, it's harder to maybe explain this for thematic, but if it, you're doing United States stamps, your scope's probably not gonna be 1847 to, to 2023 or 2022. You can't show that in 10 frames. If you were, you'd just be expected to show all the, the, the rarities or whatever. But, you know, a period, maybe the period uh, before when you had private printers or just one, you know, one issue of stamp or whatever. But you need a, a, a logical starting and ending point, whether it's a thematic or other exhibit, um, not just what fills up the number of frames you requested and you just cut it off there. It needs to be a complete story. Um, my recommendation is you do an outline and write your story before you ever put any stamps on a, on a mount stamps on an exhibit page. Um, that's not the way that most people do it. But if you write out an outline and then identify and find the appropriate material for the exhibit, you're more likely to do a good coherent story and not have too much material in one area because you want to get use everything you have or and skip other important areas of the, the thematic because you don't have any material. Um, nobody's gonna have material, you know, a, completely appropriate. You're always gonna probably have more in some areas than what you need and other areas you may not have. You may have to search for a number of years for other items. Um, this is just, uh, this is actually from 1994 or 1995, just a page. I think I had six pages before I showed for the first time where I basically wrote out the story. 
I could read the story basically before I, and then I started in bold text here indicating what I had that would fit. Uh, I think the bold ones are probably ones I used and like where it says Netherlands B311, it wasn't bold. I probably decided that that wasn't as good as the other one, so I wasn't going to use it. But that was, that's, you know, just one approach that, that I've used. Um, and like I say, this was, this is only like uh, a third of a page. I think it was six pages I had for my first five frame exhibit, which is what it was when I showed it for the first time. So key elements of an exhibit, um, the title page is generally considered the most important page. You need to tell the viewer what to expect, the purpose. Um, it's the only page you can get away without having a philatelic I am, but I would strongly recommend having one. Um, not so much in a thematic. In a thematic, often the outline or plan is on a second page, but normally you're going to see some sort of plan on the, a, th a title page. Um, catch the attention, don't overwhelm with text, just some basic thoughts. Um, some ideas on choosing material. You always want the best possible condition. Um, don't pad with duplicate items or multiples where a smaller amount will, you know, smaller thing will, will equally tell the story well. Don't waste space. If you can overlap items or window items for, for parts that aren't key, highlight key items and describe items briefly but fully, normally not including catalog numbers. Um, now, one of the things I mentioned earlier is um, thematic exhibits are judged for their uh, philatelic knowledge in part based on the number of the different types of exhibits you have. Not going through this, but here's just a, a list. This isn't necessarily even complete, but a long list of different types of elements or, or items you might want to include in a thematic exhibit. I think I have it on two slides. In fact, there's so many different things, but give you a broad, there's a lot of different, different things. And again, like I say, I can make this presentation available as a PDF or a PowerPoint to anybody who wants it. Probably PDF because the PowerPoint's rather large. Um, just some other key elements for body. Normally, if you have headers and titles, it's easier to follow. Chapter intros are nice, breaking up text into smaller blocks. Uh, for a thematic exhibit, you often want to differentiate the story information and information about the item or the philatelic information about the item. Um, and you, you need a conclusion or epilogue in any good exhibit. So here now, I think we're through. I'll take a look at, like I said, about 15 pages. Um, and I'll critique, many of them are lousy pages to tell you the truth. Um, this is my title page. Um, I don't think it's bad. Um, the fill, there are philatelic items on there. They aren't great items. You know, you, I'd love to have a key item that's really going to get people's attention on the first page. I'd love to have the um, essay of the 1940s, uh, the plasma stamp that the U.S. was had designed and was ready to issue in March 1945. It was never issued. Problem is the only copy of that essay is uh, held by the National Postal Museum. So I don't think I'll ever be getting that. Um, <laughs> but something, you know, similar that would be striking. Uh, and in general, I might get away with showing a photocopy of that or a photo of some sort of that um, in here as a, a minor item or ancillary adding to the story. But um, generally speaking, exhibit, we expect to see original material. Um, this would be a better title page if that postal card was postally used. Um, generally speaking, postal stationery is much easier to get in an unused versus used, um, certainly used as design. Um, I did window the item at the upper right, sort of like cut out a hole in the exhibit page, mounted the entire cover in the back rather than wasting space, but I uh, pretty much say what I'm planning to do. I say what it's not intended um, to do as well. Um, so for example, some people will say, well, you have to, you know, you don't have enough on the Red Cross. Well, you could do a 50 frame exhibit just on the Red Cross. So you, you need to point out 
some things how you're limiting your exhibit as well. Um, for most exhibits, you're going to have a plan probably as part of the title page. It's going to be simpler. Um, thematic exhibits are expected plans, outlines, whatever you want to call it, in a little bit more depth. Um, again, I don't think this is a bad plan. There, it could be a little bit better. I don't have any miscellaneous section. That's terrible. Um, I don't have sections, um, generally speaking, based on the type of philatelic material, which you don't want to see. I did manage to get a slogan cancellation, again, of windowed it to put along the side. Um, first uh, National Blood Donor Week, something like that, uh, um, from Spain, I believe, in 1986, or Blood Donor Day, something along those. So slogan cancellation. So I got something on, on this page as well. Um, this isn't a great page. Too much white space, um, but I'm trying to show um, exhibiting can allow you to be some cr what creative. This isn't some of this may be going a bit too far, but one of the things I wanted to do in the exhibit was to show how much blood is needed for various different types of things. So again, if this was a topical exhibit, most of the stuff on this page would not be appropriate. Um, I have gotten a meter on here, a label. Um, a self-adhesive label from Australia there. You have some cancellations, uh, like a, um, a, what do I call the German vended stamp? Um, so there's there's a variety of different elements on the page. On thematic exhibit, you'd like to see at least two to three different thematic elements on every single page. But there's too much white space. There's not a, there's a little bit of text, but it's it's not a great page. Um, this is just to show some of the other different things. You know, again, there's too much white space, but I have encased postage or in case um, uh, with uh, iris sars sarsaparilla to purify the blood and the reverse is that has the three cent US stamp, um, a booklet with, um, again, something related to blood here um, for cures. So again, trying to get different elements in. Um, and uh, here's just another page, you know, showing some meters, some stamps, a, spe a specimen stamp, um, as opposed to just a, a regular stamp. So again, just showing some um, different, different types of items here. And uh, here you have a local Bloods Penny Post. I may be stretching things a little bit. I talk about leeches instead of just showing a, an ordinary eight cent pharmacy stamp because at one point leeches were purchased at pharmacies, basically. Um, I have a color shift of the, the stamp, not real valuable, but it's a lot better than just having a common pharmacy stamp. And um, you can see cancels and, um, so forth. Um, some for you try to get some varieties in. Um, you can actually on my screen, I can actually see some of the phosphor lines, the phosphor a little bit on the comparing the the, the stamps of the Lister Centenary, the Great Britain, the non whoops, the non ah, what did I just do get back there the, the non phosphor and the phosphor. So showing varieties. Um, prefer that the cover just had the two stamps related to Lister, who was um, important in introducing um, antiseptic methods to prevent infection, um, which were very important in, in drawing blood and, and transfusing blood. Um, but at least there's two stamps there and one, it's not easy to find registered covers from Benin, uh, period. <laughs> In fact, at least uh, not this one, but Lancopex, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, I found a couple covers from Benin, I believe, but not this one for this exhibit, which I've been looking for for over 10 years. The stamps themselves are 25 cent catalog values that I had them on one list and so forth. And nobody stocks, you know, 25 cent stamps from Benin, basically. At least I couldn't even find them in sales circuits. This isn't a great page in that, in that 
I should I should have other different types. I shouldn't really have three meters here. It'd be better to have a meter and a slogan cancellation. It'd be better if the postal stationery again was actually used. Um, uh, so not a great page. I tried, this is the one of the things, the very uh, the second time I exhibited, Charlie Peterson loved this top thing, because I said, did the leeches suck all the blood out of Washington? It's an albino, uh, I think I might pay $2, pretty common, but just the red is missing basically on the stamped envelope. Um, and um, George Washington, uh, when he died basically, um, had what was probably strep throat and leeches were applied to him. Um, at that point in time, um, in fact, that they were probably um, counterproductive, in fact. Um, but um, some le leeches, in some cases, are still used today, especially for reattaching limbs. Um, and I believe Stalin also had uh, bloodletting as well, another. Um, and here's another page where I tried to Charles Drew, um, who was um, probably really the only other really only two U.S. stamps, the six cent 1971 blood donor stamp, the last six cent commemorative issued, and the 35 cent from the Great American Series for Charles Drew. He was um, set up blood banking for the American Red Cross, um, was very involved, and uh, this, if, I should have a black background or something, but probably still wouldn't show. Um, that's a perfin for Drew. I think elsewhere in the exhibit, I have a perfin, which is an ARC pattern for the American Red Cross in Cleveland. Um, so that's just, you know, another way of getting another thing is that I said Drew was perfined and killed in an automobile accident. Um, this is, I like this. Um, now I should have an explanation of the rate and hopefully showing that it would pay the appropriate rate, the registry fee and so forth. But to find a uh, a cover with, uh, what, 10 stamps and them all being blood related. Charles Bethune, who was a Canadian who uh, set up blood banks during the Spanish American, not Spanish American, Spanish Civil War, um, uh, and then went to move to China where he did a lot in blood banking, very famous. Um, and all the stamps on here were related to um, to, there is a joint issue between Canada and China as well. This may be, I think this is the, the joint issue, the Chinese version. Uh, but I like this cover definitely um, because all the stamps on it are related and that's a difficult one to find. Probably should have other things on this page though, still. Um, and I figured, okay, well, the, the Red Cross during World War II set up blood banks in our blood collection centers in uh, a limited number of cities. I think it was 35. So I figured I'd show a, a stamp with a pre-cancel from each of the 35 cities. Um, and when the blood center was set up in that city, blood collection by the Red Cross and the number of units that were collected during World War II, um, about 13.3 million units during the World War II were collected. Um, today, the U.S. uses almost that much blood every year. Um, it's following World War II. Most people assume there'd be no reason to even collect blood without the wars going on. Um, but uh, blood has really no substitute has been, um, no viable, economically viable substitute has come up for blood. And so blood is used to treat many different things today or the blood components Often, you know, the red cells, the platelets, the plasma, most, most whole blood is divided into those and some other products. Um, but again, trying to do a little creativity and, and get different things. Um, I just wanted to show a strategy that I use here. This is the back of a page. Um, as I acquire, now up above is something that's windowed. Um, it looks like a cut, cut, section from an envelope because I didn't need to show all of it. Uh, it probably looks better windowing out. But on the back, I've just slid things on the back of the page that might be better or additional items related to that page that when I redo the page, I could consider um, substituting out. And I have them 
somewhat organized. Now I still have a copy paper box full of additional material that's not sorted out or not arranged by page, but some of it I have put in the album pages or in the exhibit pages in the back um, between the page and the page protector. Um, this is uh, something, a page that I've gotten criticized for on the exhibit for two reasons, potentially. Um, um, it's basically, uh, uh, and I, I, one reason is there's no text on this page. Basically, it won't fit. But I probably should reverse window and basically have a slit so that I can have text across the center. That is a fair point. The other thing is, is this piece really big enough to justify a full page? Um, don't know. Uh, mixed feelings on that. You know, I spent too much money on this. I probably spent like $100 on this piece, which would be one of the most I've spent on any pieces in there. So, of course, I don't want to cut it up. I don't, and you know, you want to sh show it off. But is it an effective use of the space? That's a legitimate question. This is another back of a page. This just shows, I think, three or four items that are all windowed. The full items are there from the back. It can get challenging, but you know, there's no way I could have shown all these things um, if I was just had them completely on the front. That's basically the pages. Um, and just a reminder for people, the, the, the treatment, how the material is used to tell the story basically for thematic exhibit, this is at the national level, is basically 20 points. Importance, which is a very um, challenging factor, especially for thematics, but for any exhibit, is out of 10 points, basically. Philatelic knowledge and subject knowledge for a thematic exhibit are judged at of 17 and a half points each. Um, it's, it's a different breakdown if it's not a thematic exhibit. Difficulty of acquisition, rarity, 20 points. Condition, 10 points. And presentation, five points. That's for an adult at a national level. Uh, a youth exhibit, they, those are adjusted. The younger you are, the greater would be for presentation, the, the lesser for things like difficulty of acquisition. Um, some web resources, if you're interested in exhibiting, um, I have the Manual of Philatelic Judging, which is available free of charge off of the APS website. Um, then I have a few different locations where you can see um, many, many exhibits online. Um, one of the best ways to, if you do want to exhibit, is to take a look at other exhibits. If you can attend a show, attend the the feedback session here, what the judges are saying about other exhibits, take a look at them, learn from the comments there. Here's a number of shows um, that have done virtual exhibitions and at least the last I knew within the last recent few weeks still have exhibits online in the case of like Pipex and actually the Seattle show, I believe CPEX has exhibits online too. I should have gotten that up. Um, then some other, like Fran Adams, the AAPE, have a number of exhibits on their website. And I've spoken pretty close to the half hour that I said I was going to. And so I'd be glad, I saw there was one chat, which I haven't looked at, but I'd be glad uh, somebody had no sound. Hopefully they got the sound. If anybody has questions about blood donation, about exhibiting, or about the APS, I'll be glad to try to answer any of those. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, I was going to ask about Dracula, but I was kind of too embarrassed. I didn't know. I have. <laughs> I, saw uh, that you, I, I, saw that, I saw that you had it in there. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that, that's, that's really neat. Do I have you... a Transylvania cover. I have several stamps showing Dracula. Mm -hmm. um, I have bats as well. Um, um, I believe the right type of bats, because most bats don't actually suck blood, but there is at least one type that do, or some types that do. Yeah. Um, I think Tom Lehrer helped me out on that because uh, he had an exhibit on that. So uh, nice. turn, to the, turn to the expert in their own areas for what's appropriate. Mm -hmm. Now, you said this was this does some of your pages. Do any of your pages get involved at all with frozen blood that they were um, doing research with in the 70s? Not, not really. Um, 
I probably I may mention fresh frozen plasma, um, but but no, I would say generally speaking, not. Okay. The reason is, is uh, we've had a fellow who's presented, and his specialty when I knew him in the Navy was blood research and frozen blood. Mm -hmm. So I'll put you guys together. That that's fine, and this isn't even. Yeah, uh, some of you may have seen an exhibit from a Canadian exhibitor who's actually on the Canadian um, equivalent of the uh, Stamp Advisor Committee for Canada, uh, which actually won a reserve grant, I believe, at CPEX. It's a much better e exhibit than mine. She's a physician as well. So there are certainly other people with uh, exhibits. Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, pictures of her exhibit I've taken on my phone. So I think I have a picture of each. I'm not sure if each I think of each page actually. I'm gonna have to look at it. What what you know we we have similar things, but uh hers is better, no question about it. Mm -hmm. Very good. Questions for Ken, anybody on the topic or on APS? Paul, oh, I've got a question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one of your one of your bullet points on one of your first slides was to avoid the catalog numbers. In your yep. exhibit, what's mm -hmm. what's the rationale behind that? The catalog numbers. I mean, ideally, an exhibit. Um, if you want, you could put a year date or something. But different catalogs are used by different people. It's not um, um, catalog numbers. Have, they they aren't serving in a purpose. The the average viewer isn't learning anything from having a catalog number present. Basically. Um, it, that, I guess that's the that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank yeah, you. You you all you really want to be your text, and mine's not as good as it should be. But you want to keep it brief. You want to break it up into smaller blocks. Have it you know, in mobile small bits on each page as opposed to big paragraphs, which are more intimidating, less likely to be read, and you you don't want more words than needed. Um, the philatelic material should be ideally telling the story. The text helps you understand the, the story the philatelic material is showing. And just having the catalog numbers, you know, that might be fine for a reference, but that's not uh, adding anything. Um, now, if you had something expertized, it would be typical to put uh, an abbreviation like APEX or PF or PSE and the, the number, but probably in very small print, like an eight or nine point just showing that something that, um, you know, might be commonly forged or counterfeit is genuine and has been found by, you know, hopefully competent authorities to be so. All right. Other questions? Hi, Ken. Uh, my name is Don Barron, and I just had uh, a question on, you said the background is, is white all the time. Have they ever looked at using other types of like grays or off-whites or anything like that or that's a good question and there's a lots of detail we could go into but certainly happy to answer that um for most of the time white or a shade of white will be used if you're doing a postal history exhibit with covers that are older and probably dirtier it's better to use an off-white um <laughs> than a bright white bright white mm -hmm. will highlight the the dirtiness of the covers um, versus the off-white, it won't be as apparent. Um, again, the idea is to highlight the, the philatelic material, but not highlight flaws of the philatelic material. Again, some people may use um, boxes around a stamp or a cover. That's fine. However, if that cover was open roughly or it has a tear or something like that, that box may highlight that fact as well. Um, so you want to think about, um, you know, but, you know, if, if you use bright pink or something, that's what people are going to see. And it's going to distract probably from the philatelic material. But certainly I've seen um, exhibits that have used a pale blue, but most are going to be a white, uh, an ivory, um, you know, an off-white of some sort. Um, and, and in most cases, text is going to be in black. Um, I've, there are exhibits that are fine where you might have text the telling about the items in a dark blue and the text telling the story in a black, which easily differentiates it or using a different 
font, a serif versus a sans serif font for philatelic information versus story information. Those are certainly acceptable approaches. But okay. the classic exhibit, I don't remember what the exhibit was about, but there was an exhibit at Nordia 2001 that had like five different colors of text on every page. And you could basically see that exhibit from across the hall. Nobody even, like I said, I don't even remember what the exhibit was. All I remember, you get a headache if you're trying to read it too. <laughs> um, you, you don't want that. You want it to be easy for the viewer and, and not to distract from the philatelic material. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. And then um, a lot of your material referred, I guess, to uh, uh, the uh, International Red Cross. Uh, but have you seen anything in foreign countries or anything like that with with other blood donation centers or? Oh, yeah, uh, there's there, yeah. there is. I mean, I have there are. Other countries have issued in general issue a lot more stuff related to blood donation than the United States. Okay. Um, European countries, there's all kinds of pictorial cancels. Um, um, probably almost every European country has issued stamps related to blood donation or blood transfusion. Um, there, there is a, a lot of material. Um, when I started back in 93, I would say, putting the exhibit together, I think the ATA blood donor checklist had like 435 stamps, something like that. It's certainly much larger than that. And that's just stamps before you, and that's ones more on a topical basis that would show a blood drop or a blood donor or a blood bag or something, but not mm. the ones that would show, um, you know, William Harvey, who would be credited with basically discovering the circulation in the body or um, the people, the various people like Charles Drew or Norman Bethune or um, Joseph Lister for antiseptics and so forth. You know, once you branch out into that, there's just a, a huge amount. And there's also, you know, um, postal stationery um, and other things. You know, we I showed some advertising and booklet margins. There's just a lot of things that you can choose from. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Yep. Ben. Good question. Ken. Go ahead. Uh, my question is, how accurate does the uh, phyletic information have to be? Uh, the reason I ask is I know the blood stamp is really nice to see the word blood on it, but it's the family name and it was a postal, a private postal delivery uh, service. Well, and, and I understand what you're saying, the DO blood, Philadelphia local. Um, and some people would say I'm stretching too far there. Um, I'm not. Um, I'm not striving for uh, an Air National Grand Prix with this exhibit. Um, I've never even gotten a national level gold. I've gotten a local gold. Um, I've gotten some national vermeys. Um, I would say the exhibit is a strong silver week vermey as, as done now. If I took the time to completely redo it and incorporate material and and so forth, I think I could get it to a strong vermeil, maybe a weak gold. Um, and yes, I do stretch things probably further than you should. Um, yeah, the DO blood is is not specifically related to blood donation in any way. It's it's the, the name. But, but it looks nice. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It, it's a way to get another element in. Um, you know, if I was showing this internationally, it has been shown once internationally probably should be taken out for that perspective. Again, I, I'm I'm doing this more for trying to get people interested, uh, attract attention um, for some people who aren't collectors and other people who are collectors just broadening their, their knowledge um, as opposed to uh, spending as much money as I possibly can and getting the highest possible metal level. That's not my primary importance for this exhibit but now i don't want nice. to get a bronze either but <laughs> i don't think i have to worry about the bronze silver i can i could live with um shouldn't be less than a silver though <laughs> hey ken uh didn't even occur to me uh to ask uh, earlier 
<clears throat> but a lot of strange things are shipped by mail. Has blood ever been shipped in the mail? Is it shipped today in Al Express or it, what? It, it's certainly shipped today in most <laughs> cases by, uh, uh, to my knowledge, by like FedEx because um, uh, it's normally, um, it, but it's shipped all the time. Yes, blood has been shipped in the mail. I don't have any good container or anything with markings you know, special handling stamps or, or something like that. If you have something from your, you've sold your special handling exhibit, I think, but uh, uh, it certainly would be, be a interesting great if somebody had something that was, you know, marked human blood, um, uh, you know, that would be some nice markings. <laughs> but there, there, I'm sure there are cases where it has been shipped via the UPS or other mail services. And in most cases, my best of my knowledge, it's going by today, at least by private overnight carriers. Um, because in most cases, when it's being shipped like that, it's needed in a hurry. And it's, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, do well if it's sitting at room temperature or other things either. <laughs> Can I, uh, just a couple notes. I'm thinking um, it was Bill Schultz, and maybe the club members can help me. A few years ago, in one of his presentations, he just, you know, he retired as a judge and he just decided he was going to have some fun and he used color coded backing pages for his exhibits. I think he had an orange and a green and all that. And he just waved his hands and said, you know, you just had a lot of fun doing it. But one of the questions I always had is you went through the different criteria for awarding points. Mm -hmm. And I was, this is another one I was going to ask Bill. I kept, I never think, you know, now you're here, so I'll ask you on this one. What about that it's an interesting exhibit? Like, I'm looking, um, I want to see the whole thing because I'm interested in the topic and everything. But, you know, you can see some really good stuff at one of our Lankopec shows. There's two topicals on the same theme. And people were looking at it and she said, yeah, these are really good. And then said, this is a really good one and walked right past it. But it was a very good philatelic uh, exhibit, not like this is stuff thrown in the topical that was had it was an interesting topic. Is that worked into this material? I would say in interesting is not really. I mean, interesting that could, could be impacted by presentation, could mm -hmm. be impacted by you know difficulty of acquisition, rarity. Could there's a number of things here that could impact that, but. Um, and this criteria is basically the same criteria um, used by the Air National Federation of Philately and pretty much used by mm -hmm. most countries of the world. Now, at the international level, you need five more points for each medal level than you do at the national level. That's the, the typical. So um, okay. 85 will get you a gold. Um, at a national level show in the U.S., you need 90 for that gold or 90 for a large gold at the national and 95 at the international um, wow. So most countries have adopted, um, and they may have some slight variations, but pretty much these categories have been adopted um, very broadly. Um, so they're used for international shows, national shows, and local shows. There's a lot more variety, but um, mm -hmm. Europe, which tends to be a little bit more... Um, um, you, you basically have to exhibit in, in many countries at the local level, get a certain level, then you can't show at the local level anymore, then the national, then the air national. They would basically probably use this even at the local level, but again, it might be 10 points less at the local level for the award, five points less at the mm -hmm. for the national and compared to the international, something along okay. those lines. So something on your exhibit, where would you, looking at these points, where would you be getting your points, where would you might be losing your points? Like I'm thinking, um, you know, rarity, you know. I, I don't have enough in rarity, clearly. Yeah. You know, I probably wouldn't get more than, a, I probably wouldn't get more than like a 15 or 16 for difficulty mm -hmm. of acquisition rarity. Now I have some things. Um, I don't do a good enough job in some cases of pointing them out. And rarity is too often um, uh, com compared to value, they're they're not one and the same. But at the same time, it can be very difficult to convince. Now, if I can say there was a meter issued in 
I think it was 1927 for the first uh, book, textbook on board banking that was only used for two days. And, you know, there are only four copies known, you know, that that may get me some, but that's still not uh, going to get me the same level as having one of a hundred inverted jennies. Um, and that's yeah. the you know type of thing. Or that you have, a, a, you know, stamps that are very, you search 10 years for and no dealer could find, could give them, but they're a 25 cent catalog value. Yeah. It's hard to make the convincing argument that, you know, you have that difficulty of acquisition, but that's part of what you have the synopsis to try to make your case on mm -hmm. some of those mm -hmm. things. And especially a national level show, it's very important that you submit a synopsis and you, you, you make some of those arguments for yourself. I mean, I would lose... I would lose some on just about everything. I don't have, you know, like the the registered cover. I didn't have the the rate explained for how many ounces at how much plus what the registry fee was, if there was any insurance and so forth. Any cover that's other than like a first class rate, you should have that. And that's again, you have to be very broad, do a lot of research and knowledge because who's going to know the the rates of Benin or South Africa or you know, Swaziland or, or wherever. You have to obviously have to do research, but those mm -hmm. are things that are being looked at. Do you, can you explain that? Is it paying the proper rate? Um, presentation, some judges will give five as the default. Everyone will basically get, it's lousy if it's less than a four. So you don't, it's hard to lose points there, I would say. Mm -hmm. Condition, in most cases, most people are gonna get most of it now. Condition, you understand. I didn't show it, but I have a crash cover um, in in the exhibit, basically saying that you know victims of the crash um, needed blood, um, and obviously that crash cover is in lousy condition, um, but that's expected. <laughs> <laughs> um, subject knowledge, I'd probably do pretty well. Um, importance, it's hard for a thematic exhibit to get more than a seven or an eight. Um, importance is. One of the things a lot of judges, I think, would like to see disappear because it involves, you know, preconceived notions of what is some areas are more important than other. And yes, you may agree that an exhibit of the penny black being the very first postage stamp is probably more important than, than an exhibit on the 20 cent U.S. Supreme Court stamps um, or other things like that. But trying to is, is a thematic exhibit on blood donation more or less important than either one of those or, or where's the fall? It's, it's very hard for anybody to define um, importance, although there is some criteria in the judging manual for it. Um, treatment, I should do reasonably well because I think I have a, a pretty decent story, but um, I'm gonna lose um, probably uh, typically um, 20, to 25 points on the exhibit at a national level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, in the last issue of American Stamp Dealer and Collector, uh, in his editorial, Wayne Youngblood was talking about kind of the state of exhibiting, just not a uh, judgment or anything, but you know the, some of the things that are changing, you know, the combining of shows, uh, a fewer, less opportunities to exhibit, um, you know, the judges, you know, aging out and things mm -hmm. like that. What is your, you're, you're involved in, you're way younger than most of us. So what would you say the state of exhibiting is? Um, all those are, all those are, are fair assessments. Um, the exhibiting um, is um, certainly number one, a small number of people partake in it and have always, I mean, maybe, you know, that 5% number I say it might have been 7 or 8% at one point in time, but it's never been a large percent to, to go to that next step. Um, certainly, there's a challenge in judges. Um, I think I'm, I hope not, but for a long time, I was the second youngest accredited judge and probably was for 10 or 15 years, the second youngest accredited judge. That's not good to say that. We need younger new, fresher blood in there. I, I'm probably still in the top five or 10 after having been an accredited judge over 20 years um, among the five or 10 youngest. Uh, exhibiting doesn't, 
cover its costs typically. Um, normally shows have to subsidize it. Um, there have been, if you went back to the Phil Tuck exhibitor, the AAPE, American Association, Phil Tuck exhibitors publication, oh, Phil Steger, probably around the late 1990s, he estimated the real cost is like $75 a frame. Um, no, and virtually that's what you have to pay at an international show or a little bit more than that today, frequently at an international show. But you wouldn't get many exhibitors probably at those frame fees at a national level show. Um, now, some people will say, you know, exhibits will bring in big spenders in some cases if they haven't purchased everything or if they can find material. Um, you know, and get some people to come to the show. But um, on the other hand, you know, some shows are trying new things. They're trying digital exhibits. Digital exhibits were tried 15 years ago, I think at one of the New York mega event shows. Um, and really that didn't go over too well. I think somebody included some material that they didn't own, um, which was a, a challenge <laughs> at that point in time. Uh, but you know, the pandemic um, has, has brought back or gotten people taking a look again. Um, I think Kane J is not exactly sure how to handle um, the digital exhibits, uh, but that certainly can reduce some of the costs, um, easier to share them, in some cases easier for judging um, in some ways because judges could potentially see them online and study them well before the show, as opposed to at a typical show where you might have five minutes per exhibit to judge, even if it's 10 frames, 160 pages, where you can't possibly read everything. Other judges would say, yeah, but now we're expected to spend two hours on this exhibit as opposed to the five or 10 minutes. There's, you know, pluses and minuses. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, I think exhibiting has evolved. It's much more um, democratic, maybe. It's much more open to creativity to, I mean, you can have a first day cover exhibit today. 20 years ago, a first day cover exhibit would be doing well to get above a solar. Um, you can now have a first day cover exhibit that can easily get a gold and so forth. So the, 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 the idea that's just whatever is the most valuable wins the grand award, that's sort of gone away. We've, and we've come up with standards have evolved. And so in many ways, I would say exhibiting's in better uh, better place today than it was 20 years ago, but not necessarily more people or more opportunities or more judges. Okay, good, thank you. Questions, anybody Other for, for Ken? Dick, did you wanna say something? Yeah, I was just gonna comment on your, uh, your, your mentioning Europe thematic collecting on the other side of the pond is hugely mm -hmm. popular. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I was exhibiting at the French National Exhibit six, seven years ago, and the grand award went to a thematic exhibit. Yep. And that was that was kind of a first for some of those people. But uh, the, the immediate past president of the club that I belong to over in France has a a, an amazing exhibit of playing cards on stamps. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been able to add some things from this side of the pond to that one, but um, it's very, very popular over there. Yep, I, there, there, are, there are definitely, I don't can't explain why, but there are definitely differences um, by areas of the world of the, the types of exhibits. Maximophily is much more popular in Europe. It's barely even known um, you know, see maximum cards exhibited in the U.S. If it's done two or three times a year at a national level show, that's a lot. Um, much more common in Europe, I believe. Yeah, and, and it's also easier to get kids into exhibiting um, from a thematic end of it. Um, they're, you know, they, they, they adapt to that very well. And so on the other side of the pond, there are many, many more young exhibitors Great. Then you have over here. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank More you. Questions. <clears throat> More questions for Ken? Well, then well maybe off it. topic, but I did see this question uh, in an earlier um, 
private chat. Um, how is summer seminar lining up? Doesn't that open up like after the first of the year? I, I don't what think are it's going to open looking up like for in person this year. Um, well, I'm 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 hopeful, but we have a um, Eric Spielvogel joined the APS as director of education ooh, right around Thanksgiving. Um, so while I expect you'll see uh, save the date um, and so forth. I don't believe that we have um, courses, electives, and so forth. So I think that'll be a little, a little bit later, but we, we definitely need to promote it. I mean, I certainly hope that we can have it uh, uh, in person. That's something that uh, I've certainly missed the last two or three years. For sure. Other questions? APS issues? Okay. Well, Ken, we want to thank you very much. We'll give you a PSL cheer. You're most welcome. Thank you for, really, all, for really your attention great, and time. Great. Yeah, no. And uh, like I said, we know where you live, so I'll call you again. Okay. <laughs> it's been, yeah, well, you know, going, we have, you know, with two meetings a year now, it's been really nice to um, reach out, you know, through digital with people coming from all over the place uh, who are, you know, visiting. Yeah, I see Rochester. I see California. You really do have a yeah. Delaware, I think. Uh, yeah. yeah uh, I saw, Connecticut or Massachusetts. So, yes, you have a variety of. So, a couple items in your uh, presentation that I think uh, Larry Rosenblum would like out in, out in California. <laughs> okay. 